Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, two, three. Where's my notes? So we're going to start the last segment uh, with Charles, Charles Jenks, then Alejandro, who might be on his way, Brett, and finally Zaha. There might be a slight change of sequence. But, and afterwards, uh, there will be a few minutes uh, realigning chairs, and then we, 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 we might have another a final kind of podium showdown with, with hopefully lots of audience uh, participation. But anyway, as we said earlier, audience can intercept and, and, and interject and ask questions at any, any point in time. Great. Um, hello, hello, is this working? Uh, Patrick, thank you for asking me to uh, leap to your defense. Uh, but um, with friends like me, as they say. I'm delighted to be at the AA again and take part in this uh, uh, interesting discussion on your book. Uh, I want to make some po historical points because I, I think, as I've understood, it hasn't been a, a day of history today particularly. and. The idea of an autonomous architecture, of course, goes right back to the beginnings of theory, uh, architecture theory in Egypt, and then uh, surviving books, of course, Vitruvius, who talks about science, cosmology, what an architect has to know, semiology, and so forth, always trying to upgrade the profession of an architect and uh, the talent of an architect, the skill of an architect, and the beauty of architecture. So your book, is in that historical trajectory, and you do invoke, uh, you start, your, your history starts with Alberti, which is absolutely understandable, but I don't, although I don't understand why. Um, anyway. Because um, <laughs> we don't uh, know any other architects. <laughs> um, and Before the, the um, autonomy, of course, my teacher was Siegfried Gideon, who wrote Space, Time, and Architecture, and a whole lot of other things, Mechanization, Man. He said that you know, the moral question in architecture was uh, really debated in the 19th century with people like Berlaga who wanted to put architecture on a scientific and moral basis and an autonomous basis. And of course, that has been the great role of theory again and again and again and again, uh, right up to Aldo Rossi, who tried to create an, uh, an autonomy for architecture. And you, you invoke Christopher Alexander. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the elephant who's not in the room, Peter Eisenman and his notion of the critical, uh, which was another attempt to, to gain a kind of autonomy for our discourse. And Peter uh, Eisenman is quite clear about his uh, attempt of the critical stemming from Immanuel Kant, and I think, you know, that's, and you're German? That's right. Well, <laughs> okay. about. Uh, where, where are you from, actually, may I ask? I'm from a provincial so. suburb of a, a small town somewhere in Germany. Königsberg? No. No. <laughs> Emmanuel, <laughs> Emmanuel Kant, by the way, believe it or not, people in this room won't believe it, was Scottish. Okay? He came from Scotland. I mean, his family, the word, mm. the name. Anyway, and you think of the Scottish Enlightenment, but uh, if you don't believe me, look, look up Billy Kay and, and you'll read it. Anyway, Emmanuel Kant tried to form a critical, rational, uh, discourse uh, uh, for different fields. And in a certain sense, when modernism is discussed uh, and the Enlightenment is discussed, it's Immanuel Kant. And uh, that, the direct bloodline from Immanuel Kant, Clement Greenberg, and his uh, discourse on modernism and the modern painting was to define things as you do by what they're not and to demarcate uh, uh, a special, specialized discourse that would be particular painting. And defining things by what they're not, of course, is, is an impossible um, uh, task. If we say all, all the is things- Is there any other way? All the things in uh, this room which are, are not men, uh, of course, aren't necessarily women. There are an infinite number of other things in this room. So you can't define things by what they're not, as I will be showing in a second. 
But the, nevertheless, there is this historical attempt again and again and again, and, and the canon was mentioned earlier, in, in order to produce progress, in order to produce uh, a, um, a profession, you have to have a theory uh, to a degree and a practice and a canon. So you're in this long line of, of people trying and I would say failing. Um, there are two Was ways, not, a failure? not failing to define it, but failing practically. No, you succeed very well. I love your book, but I don't think it stands a chance to succeed for, very, for two reasons. One is that... How about your book? Was it a failure well, too? My book, my book has succeeded too, but, it, uh, but, uh, but to sell, sell copies, but it doesn't succeed at very Come on. far. Now, architects, the reason uh, problematic, your book is problematic, uh, is that architects only uh, design maybe 1% of the world's buildings, or perhaps 5%, and maybe in Britain they influence and manipulate another 20%, but the statistics of actually architect design buildings is very small. Of course, it's growing, and the profession has an ideological stake, as you do, in upping the percentages. So I understand what you're doing, and I applaud uh, the intent, even though I think it's hopeless. Um, you, you won't get much power, uh, and uh, so that's one problem. The, the second one is a moral problem. Uh, is, is the problem of the relation between an architect and a client or society. Because architecture, for me, and a lot of architects, is ne a necessarily mixed genre in which the client is half the creator. It's the client's money often, and uh, the client has to, the taste of the clients, the will and desire are mixed up with, with architecture necessarily half the design. So it's a moral, you present a moral problem when you try to take over uh, the control of the profession in such a uh, strong way. In any case, uh, there's another aspect to this and that's the parametric. For the last 15 years, when I've been in the school, I've been asked by students to talk about parametric architecture and I've mentioned Luigi Moretti and I've mentioned you more than five times in Venice and elsewhere, have you read Luigi Moretti on parametric architecture? And has Luigi Moretti been discussed today? I'm sure he has. I'm sure you've had an hour of discussion. <laughs> no, no, I looked no, at No, you haven't. Uh, okay. I don't so therefore, I'll read you a little bit of okay. Luigi Moretti on parametric. This is from Adrian Shepard, who were a British architect who worked with him. Uh, when he defining the parametric, uh, Moretti in the 60s when he put forward parametric architecture and the 70s when he had an exhibition on it in Milan, uh, defined it along with intuition. I'll quote you from Adrian Shepard. Moretti had a genuine interest in science and mathematics. Mathematics provided him with a gratifying sense of intellectual order which he believed should be applied to architecture and town planning. Ever since 1939, Moretti had encouraged research in objective and scientific ways to link modern mathematics, urbanism, and architecture. His premise was that a new architecture, one he labeled parametric architecture, should be derived from absolute mathematical truths independently of other factors. The clarity, purity, and objectivity of mathematics and geometry should be the primary determinants of form and space. In 1960, Moretti also organized a major exhibition on parametric architecture in Milan, and in 1971, the periodical Mobius I devoted a complete issue to the parametric architecture. Though Mar Moretti was attracted, sorry, uh, was attracted to the logic of mathematics and geometry, he also knew that reason alone does not lead to good architecture. Art or architecture can never exist totally outside the realm of the senses, and Moretti placed great emphasis on intuition, instinct, feeling, and the humanist tradition. His creative process was as much cerebral as it was in um, intuitive act. And he distinguished strongly between those areas in a stadium, for instance, that you could parametricize and those you couldn't. And so he, uh, you know, he put forward a, a kind of what you might call a double code uh, for his par um, which included. Now, um, I, I mention all that because I don't think you can discuss 
the par I don't believe that you can discuss these issues outside of history. Um, and I believe th it raises uh, uh, moral questions of citizenship. And I don't believe you can uh, discuss things through exclusion, the modernist uh, defining things by what they're not. So I want to start, uh, just show a couple of slides of my own work to show why your work is impossible. Um, starting with, uh, you know, the Plato's uh, image, God, the great architect of all things, um, the notion that defines the, the simplicity and beauty uh, that uh, parametric architecture Moretti was seeking. You can see God uh, laying out the universe in this 13th century uh, painting, watercolor, as a middle-aged man, 33 years old, with a beard and an architectural instrument, stepping out of the picture frame and uh, laying out the universe as earth, air, water, and fire, uh, according to the Greek uh, four elements. And a lot of it uh, are primary, the primary Platonic uh, Philippian solids and beauty. But you notice there are squiggly waves. And even then, there was an understanding that the geometry of nature might be fractal. OK, so um, today, of course, uh, there is a historical movement towards uh, a cosmogenic uh, worldview. And you can't insulate architecture either from theories of society, theories of the cosmos, theories of, of science, and theories of the universe. Now, one of the most important uh, uh, articles, uh, according to many uh, uh, theorists of art, is Rosenkraut's famous uh, essay uh, called Sculpture in the Expanded Field, uh, written in 79 and published many times. Uh, and uh, it remains a canonic definition of the crisis that was uh, sculpture, non-sculpture, I should say, was going to in 19, in the 60s and 70s with land art, uh, a whole lot of works of Mary Miss and uh, artists, um, Richard Long and others who were creating not sculpture, but which curators and, and art critics were assimilating into sculpture. And even today, uh, you go to this, uh, this show at the uh, Royal Academy and you know the golden ages of uh, British sculpture and you'll find that uh, the curators have not dealt with sculpture in the expanded field. The fact that most of the uh, work from, most of the creative work from the 70s and 80s was uh, outside the field of sculpture, but still discussed as if it were sculpture um, and this creates a real problem, which Rosalind Krauss is right to identify. But what she does after identifying it is to define um, the expanded field, uh, marked sites, uh, site construction, axiomatic structures, sculpture. She, she generates this Boolean diagram by uh, these antitheses. So she says there's a category of not landscape and not architecture, which sets up uh, these spaces, the kind of uh, hyperspace, semantic space of how sculpture can expand into these other territories. This, uh, so although her analysis of what's wrong is correct, uh, her attempt to define things by what they're not, I think, is foolhardy. And I think that your attempt suffers from the same problem. So I, I say that because my own work uh, is uh, mixed up completely between urbanism. I find uh, the landforms I do uh, are partly architecture, partly sculpture, partly planting, partly gardens, partly uh, everything, uh, including other, other things that I don't have control over. N in other words, it's a kind of messy, mixed, hybrid uh, uh, art form, landforming. Um, and uh, the, uh, that, that was a, a, a cosmic uh, representation of the universe, 13.7 uh, bil billion years of the universe, which culminates at the top with the representation of uh, two galaxies hitting, the, the Milky Way and Andromeda. So it's an it's a, uh, architectural and sculptural and gardening version of, uh, of, of communicating content. My point is that if you have a content-driven 
uh, land forming. It's necessarily hybrid. So my diagram that uh, is a critique of, of her, of Rosalind Krauss's work, <laughs> is, uh, is to say that landform is really uh, the important uh, conceptual thing is it's between categories. It's not excluding uh, uh, categories. And I think that is what architecture is, basically. Like opera, it's a, it's a mixed genre, a messy genre. And it's necessarily um, mixed up with the desires of the client and the content of society. Is that done? Thanks. Thanks. I think that some interesting themes um, I could uh, comment on. The first uh, question I have in return is where do you locate yourself in, in the spectrum between art and design? Uh, where do you want to impact? Do you see these uh, as a continuum or do you see the, the sharp demarcation in trying to establish between art versus design? Now I, my point is that content, if you look at uh, uh, architecture, landscape, and the arts uh, as being content driven, then it is necessarily between the categories. So. Uh, you know, I, I don't try to demarcate uh, art and design. And I think, paradoxically, your work, which is connected to the contemporary avant-garde, I would argue that the, the avant-garde has itself been trying to break down categories. So precisely going the opposite direction that your theory goes in, Patrick. I would, I would say all great avant-gardes have been defined by a breakdown of demarcation. That's the definition of an avant-garde. And so you paradoxically, uh, you know, mixing two ideas. Well, I think what is important for me to establish um, the distinction between what I call the great function systems of society, which I think these distinctions are, I would call them ultra-stable um, and ever more harshly drawn, and the violation and crossing of this boundary ever more perceived as a violation of corruption. The distinction between the legal process and the political process is very sharply drawn. The, 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 the distinction between uh, politics and science and the rejection of scientists telling politicians what to do or politicians uh, indicating uh, the, the trajectory of science. Uh, the, I think the, uh, the, the same I would apply is very harshly uh, uh, and, uh, and more and more happening between art and architecture. Art and architecture slash design. I mean, that's, there's this kind of anachronism of, of a reflective category where it's, you know, the arts are listed and including architecture, music, painting, sculpture. And, and I believe there's a very, very harsh distinction because these discourses are utterly incommensurable by now. And what I do see that, yes, maybe the distinction between sculpture, painting, installation art, land art, they, they are kind of starting to blur, like perhaps scientific disciplines amongst themselves. You can migrate, you can kind of fuse and have interdisciplinary research or, uh, but, but the dis so, so that for me is no argument. Well, what would you say that about you have opera? The blurring what, what, what would you say about opera? Okay. I rest my case about, I mean, architecture is like opera. Well, opera is an... And is would you have, op would you, I mean, it's, it's look, one of, look at Wagnerian opera, it's, you know, it's, he it's, wanted to combine Well, that's a different era. That's and, a different uh, era. And Shakespeare. Um, you know, he That's a different era. I'm talking about, if you're talking well, about... Uh, this is actually contemporary opera. I know. If you're talking about contemporary opera, then it's in the art system, as far as I'm concerned. And, and um, it also has a much, much uh, smaller audience as, as the Wagnerian operas. And I think to home in on this point, I, I've, I have to ask you, uh, where do you want to impact? And I don't think that the works you're presenting are part of a contemporary art system. Uh, where you're theorizing, like art is being theorized, where you, where you in the context of, you m would have to be in the context of um, figures like Damien Hirst, uh, Anish Kapoor, um, rather than the, the context of, of uh, Zaha Hadid, Wolf Briggs, um, 
where, where, do we, where, where do you impact? Because I feel, and my statement here is that these, right. these dis discourses have been But I'm working with Damien this Hirst and H. Kapoor and, and Zaha, so I don't, I don't see any problem. Well, well, I see, I'm just recognizing <laughs> the fact. I mean, what, what do you Maybe want? Maybe the lines of others. Do you see an art practice or a practice like yours which is indifferent to the distinction as, as directly in, in affecting the lines of others as do thy practice? Yeah. I mean, it's really a simple question. Because he, is, he, has a, he has an ambition to a new instrumentality. It's not causal and not demonstrable through testing, but nevertheless has a stronger communicating function and has a greater social ambition and immediate efficacy than art does. So I think he's just trying to get you to just admit you're an artist and everything you're ready to do and we can move on. I wanted to ask a question about slice of parametrics, which yeah. seems to be yeah. Yeah. by raising the numerity, you know, it it was in a sense, the need for a, a sort of expanded field of parametricism. I mean, not only th is the historical uh, issue not really taken up, I'm always surprised never to see a reference to that discourse where, in a sense, it's a traditional and permanent feature of the discourse, which, of course, is in economics. Now, in that sense, um, in the 19th century, when you get, you know, in the 1870s, 1880s, a new generation of people who become a more, what you might call, more sophisticated neoclassical kind of economists, uh, many of them at kind of UCL, you get a distinction drawn up to then, people just talk about the market, but from this moment onwards, you get a distinction drawn between what you might call the institutions and performance of actual marketplaces, many of which often go wrong, and what has to be right, and what from then on are referred to as the parametric functions of the market. That is to say, the functions which a market must fulfill in addition to just doing the stuff every day. Now, that kind of reaches an interesting position in the 30s, when some people who would call themselves, in a sense, parametric kind of socialists, actually, but a group of completely orthodox neoclassical economists, but because of the pressure in the states and also to some people on the left, the openings uh, of the New Deal, begin to ask the question, how could you have an economy, absolutely unlike the Soviet Union, which you could call socialist, uh, but actually maintains the market? without having necessarily the institutions of the market. Now, all those discussions which were taken up in Poland and Hungary in the 70s and 80s, there are two interesting things about them. One is they're all premised on the continuing need for money, even if it's not used in the real economy, if you see what I mean. That is to say that it, main, that it maintains itself as a unit of account and in a sense as a notional store of capital. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be used everywhere as a medium of exchange. <coughs> so they say you could imagine then having a sort of planned economy based on the parametric functions of the market. Of course, you need the notion of money, even if you're going to restrict it, because for all the functions, there has to be a universal language of yeah. translation. And that's the basis for it. They say, we think this could be possible, but of course, you'd have to invent a machine which could do hundreds of thousands of simultaneous equations in seconds. Of course, there's no such machine. <laughs> now, now there's a machine. I, this is not about, for me, about socialism. It, it's, I don't understand quite, without a unit or ultimately a language of translation at a formal level, which can be in some sense subject to computation, how the, the sort of the real parametric character can ever really kind of exist, I mean, or come to fruition. Yeah, I mean, George Soros, when he 
when he talks about the theories of economics and uh, talks about uh, the current um, you know, crises with CDOs and CDSs, which people don't understand, the package debt, uh, brings in this interesting uh, point that you're, you're raising about a parametric economy. And it is, it's a reflexive economy, too, as well as being parametric. So uh, it, it's obviously uh, impossible um, to totally theorize correctly because the theory interacts with the economy, which is one of his points. It's the Oedipus effect, the, the effect of the prediction on the event that Oedip happened to Oedipus. And I think we'll never get an architectural theory that isn't slightly um, obvious. Can I say something about, uh, about this? I think that the, the reference to Moretti doesn't convince me because he's fully launched within the modernist project. And yes, of course, he's using uh, kind of calculations to optimize stadium positions. Uh, uh, but, uh, but it's language. Absolutely. And I think, and, and I think if, uh, 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 Theo reminded me in the interim that um, I had to come up with a name for this, for the contemporary convergence avant-garde, which draws more and more young architects into its ambit and which keeps cumulative researching. I used the word parametricism. I mean, uh, it's not only premised on parametric design systems. Uh, it's, it's a whole panoply of computational processes. On the one hand, it's uh, generative um, um, algorithmic structures, uh, agent modeling, uh, a kind of panoply of these, but it, more importantly, it has a certain series of criteria of values which are pursued and w which are brought to bear in the critique and deliberation of these designs, which are fundamentally different uh, than the modernist project. So that, but I do feel there is, a, and I've said it before, there is a history, uh, there's a precursor, which I identify with Frey Otto, which is a true precursor of what we now uh, come to call parametrism. There's no accident that we have, in, in, in love with Frey Otto, keep going back to Frey Otto and, and, and drawing out uh, research and, and insights and processes of Frey Otto's work. But I don't see uh, Moretti to be a precursor. And maybe sometimes, uh, the phrase parametric is not enough, and, and the use of some kind of optimizing calculation is not enough. But can I uh, make it, I'd like to make it a little easier mm -hmm. and actually use the example that Charles raised about yeah. Rosenkraus and the sculpture in his Hispanic field. Um, as Charles and others will know, the effect of that article over the long run was to turn all sculpture into site-specific installation and to produce such a hegemony of site-specific installation that basically it had it destroyed the world of sculpture, so much so that she <laughs> wrote an apology called Voyages on the North Sea, is that the name of it? Uh, yeah. Wherein she goes back to apologize for the effect of the essay. Uh, at, at, and now, one of the things you've introduced earlier, because today is finally clearing up, is one of the, I think, one of the instruments that has motivated your work is this tool we have, and which is so agile and so supple that it can enter into any context and make minute connections to those contexts in very intimate and profound ways. Um, and that's exactly how site-specific sculpture started. And as a result, exactly what you're predicting happened, you will take over the stuff and it will produce such a hegemony of tedium and such a monotony of the same kinds of, of uh, connections that it will inevitably require a completely new invention of non-site relations and so I think it's actually a you're very asking him to but, but I believe the contextual no. <laughs> I think yeah. this work you're talking about is in fact in terms of its former repertoire still working with platonic hermetic figures so the, 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 the affiliation to context is more through materiality through through scale but not I wouldn't recognize these as precursors uh, although it on the on a more abstract level yes the kind of axiom of contextual affiliation to certain and site specificities there, which modernism didn't include in its repertoire and was quite happy to just land spaceships wherever it, it went. But that's not enough. Um, um, it's just an abstract intention, perhaps. But if you look at these projects now, they're, they're, they're miserably fail the criteria of our aesthetics. They're very kind of crude. Yeah. Like every, every opera house. <laughs> local river, local rock, and then local fence, <laughs> 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 
How does that one of the other appear that we have? <laughs> That's the, I, I have to admit that this, the, the kind of, the metaphor is obfuscating the, um, uh, the, the, the pertinence of this project, if anything. So um, um, I'm thinking in terms of elaborated analogies rather than metaphors which are one-line uh, conditions, perhaps, the way they used in architecture. Um, yeah. sorry. This is partly uh, in response to the reference to Kant. Uh, theories of autonomy that have been brought to architecture have tended to devolve to, onto the issue of form and the diagramming of form, uh, insofar as Kant, the Kant-Greenberg translation goes to Peter Eisenman, I suppose. But what I, I take it that you're trying to do is to produce a theory of autonomy that rather involves program. And in Absolutely. this, you seem to remind me of John Summerson's 1957 argument, uh, is there a, a theory of modern architecture, in which he suggests that a program it must be the paradigm or the, the principle of unity, as he calls it, except that he was very pessimistic at that time about how that would actually produce a formal language. But in your case, you seem to want to uh, find a, a cause for optimism in, in that through parametricism. But um, the, in doing this, it's as if you somehow displace the idea of program. And so I was thinking of, of Rosalind Krauss's uh, <coughs> diagram. It's, it's like program in the expanded field. That's what parametricism is. Well, well, to a certain extent, I mean, the, 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 the double code of utility and beauty is, in a sense, uh, and in terms of the avant-garde, utility, beauty, novelty, is the demarcation device. And I would just come back to uh, Charles' earlier initial statements. I believe there's no other way than to define something other than through negativity, through demarcation. And that's an insight we gain through structuralism and uh, was sustained in post-structuralism. Um, but to come back to uh, to way I see autonomy, I think the concept of autopaces is, for the first, is perhaps able for me anyway, to, to kind of terminate and resolve this unfruitful, endless, yeah. oscillating discourse about the supposed autonomy or not of architecture. And the formula which we pick up from Luhmann is openness through closure. It seems paradoxical, but there's, it can be explicated. So it's an adaptive openness through self-referential closure. That means that we, as an autonomous Discourse autonomous in the sense that we are in charge, and we are given universal responsibility and competency to 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 structure and and solve all issues of the built environment and, and of design. But we are obligated to this, you know to to make this with, with relevancy, Patrick with with adaptive performance. They aren't in charge. This wait, is wait, fantasy. wait. What I'm trying to say is there is um, um, we have to be adaptive through the self-referential closure. The clients can, de can de demand and expect a feasible and viable and vibrant product, but they're not going to instruct us how to do it. They're not holding our hand. They're not intervening in our drawings. They can only send us on another cycle of reworking, which we work and discuss on our terms, with our concepts, with our internal experts. And okay. that's the autonomy, but the autonomy is, 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 is a kind of borrowed uh, um, uh, privilege. Back. As I said earlier, the, uh, the developments and the end of architecture is always near. There's no guarantee that you succeed. You have to make it succeed. And that's why you have to have bring in world references. And it's our collective responsibility to, to make architecture a success story in the world. And, uh, and, and every now and then, this runs into crisis and mavericks and clients and, 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 and uh, outside architecture, spontaneous right. actions uh, happen where architectures, when the, the kind of discourse of architecture went bankrupt, that's why you have retroactive manifestos Patrick, uh, and specific? the relearning. That's the autonomy, the kind of borrowed autonomy and responsibility. But, um, because I'm now very interested in the site-specific question. Yeah. And in your book, you make an important, uh, are, you make a claim that essentially what was the most important factor in architecture for a long time, which was space, yeah. has now given way to the field. Yeah. And um, I, think that's prob I think that's true, and I agree with you. However, I think we have much more subtle relationships to what constitute fields now. 
So for example, the Cincinnati, your Cincinnati unit, you're in Zaza Cincinnati building, and most of your work is absolutely dedicated to the proximate field, to the local conditions yep, and sure, that sure, field sure. condition. Yep, yep, yep. If you look at Seattle Library, it's, a, it's an architecture about the remote field in the argument that authentic economies and communities are no longer based on proximity and architecture. So every piece of furniture in it, the change in tiling, the change in materiality, everything about that project is a field project, but a field project about a metropolitan field as opposed to a proximate field. What I want to know is how does parametric architecture give you the ability to have the thought? You, it, someone must theorize that we have a different political social economy, that, we, that communities of remote exchange are perhaps even more authentic than communities of proximate exchange. And therefore, when we think about the field, we cannot take for granted the local site-specific condition or the urban field, and that we have to have to shift to a conceptual field like the metropolitan field. We're, that's what I want to know. Where is it in that instrument that allows for that possibility? Because that leap isn't contained in your theory. Not in the instrument. Well, to a certain extent, the, the field can expand through action by distance because you can script any kind of sets of associations, correlations, however far apart they are. But to a certain extent, Whatever is in the visual field, what's go, which yeah, comes, the hand but, of but, Seattle but, but, but I'm, let me is I, crucial I, to its. I success. agree with you. I, it's, a, it's a very good distinction. I love that proximate field versus extended on uh, uh, um, um, conceptual field, and I agree with that. And that comes to bear in the semiotic project, in the fact that yes, we have to think about perception and the perceptual probability and conspicuity and legibility of complexity. How do you decompose a complex scene that becomes still comprehensible? That's the proximate field. But all of these operations are still, and we're intuitively aware of this, they operate in a kind of global semiotic field, morphological field of associations, of buildings I've seen, I remember, I want to associate with, identify with. And that needs to be reflected. And that's not in the tools of uh, of, of parametric algorithmic work, but it's in the, in the conceptual set, set out and, and will be made topical, is made topical in volume two, which is, by the way, already uh, handed to the publishers. <laughs> but, but therefore, I can't, unfortunately, I can't integrate this, this discourse on the proximate field versus the kind of expanded field. But the solution is, as I said, a kind of um, semiotic field, which is world spanning. Semiotics to the rescue. <laughs> well, thank you very much, You're Patrick. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I love your things uh, in the field, in the swarm, when you talk about your, your, the city is a swarm, and it's not a proximate mm -hmm. swarm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a metaphor. You, you say it's an analogy, an extended analogy, but uh, very nice swarm. Okay, thank thanks, you. Charles.